The interstate system has been a great way to travel around America for over 60 years, using a simple design and thought process to be exactly the way it is. But when you go further down, not every interstate is perfect. Sometimes simple rules that make the system what it is are completely thrown out the door, and the interstate is bended to become whatever the designers in that area want it to be. So today we're going to take a look at some of the most interesting oddities found throughout the interstate system for a second time on this channel. Before we get into the video though, I wanted to quickly and simply ask if you would consider subscribing to the channel. The Beaver Geography channel has been fulfilling a lifelong dream of mine with its current success. So if you would consider simply subscribing to the channel if you're interested in the content, it would be amazingly appreciated. Thank you. So let's start out with one that I've been holding on to since the start of this channel. That being Interstate 78 in Jersey City, and specifically the point right before it goes into Holland Tunnel. There's about a half mile of roadway where I-78 simply becomes a normal street. Stoplights, gas stations, fast food, all right on an interstate. If there wasn't signage, nobody would know this was part of the interstate system, because it looks nothing like an interstate. Now the history behind this is that this portion of I-78 was built well before the interstate system was a thing, back in 1927. So because the DOT wanted I-78 to go through the Holland Tunnel, the only two options were completely tearing down a perfectly good neighborhood, or just going with it. So they decided to make an exception here, and just let I-78 become a normal surface road for half a mile. Next up we have I-93 in northern New Hampshire, specifically the portion in the White Mountains, north of Lincoln and south of Franconia. Now this stretch of interstate is going through some of the most treacherous mountains in all of the northeast, and they don't have much room for lane expansion and widening. So an exception was made here that the interstate could be two lanes instead of the required four. Yes, this means that there's a stretch of interstate that is literally just a two-lane road with a weak metal divider. And this isn't just for a little bit of time, it's a five and a half mile stretch. And there's even an exit where the interstate is still just two lanes. Now, I know it has to do with funding, but I don't get why they didn't just end the interstate before it got to the White Mountains and turn it into a state highway. If it's in an area where you physically can't make a roadway up to interstate standards, then you can't make an interstate. This route isn't even that important, because if there was ever a situation where you could safely make an interstate two total lanes, I just don't think it would even needs to be an interstate in the first place. Staying on the theme of two-lane interstates, next we're going to be talking about I-81 in Thousand Islands, New York. This is in the northern part of the state, located five miles from the Canadian border. Here there's a bridge to get onto the island, where the interstate goes down to just two lanes. But what makes this one even worse than the last, is that there isn't even a divider over the bridge. It is literally just a two-lane road, with nothing but a yellow line stopping you from going into traffic going the other way. Now it's pretty obvious why this happened, basically the bridge was there before the interstate, and since they wanted to keep I-81 all the way up to the Canadian border, they decided to just roll with it and ignore the standards set in place for an interstate highway. Now for this one, my opinion is the same. Why wouldn't you just end the interstate before it goes over the bridge, maybe at this interchange here instead of right at the border? That's where it stops being up to the standards, and there's nothing stopping you from just ending it. Really just seems stupid that they would ignore the rules set in place just to make it easier for them. Next we have one that isn't against the rules, but it's just a little weird and that's I-35 East in St. Paul. This is a pretty elaborate highway and has a lot of twists and turns. Then to go with that, for some of the time, it's all the way down to two or three lanes, which is not a lot when you take a look at the population of the area it's in. But because of this reason, I-35 East is down to 45 miles per hour as a speed limit for several miles south of the downtown. Locals apparently call it the practice freeway because if you're a new driver, this would be the perfect place to start freeway driving, slow and simple. Next up, we're talking about repeat interstate numbers, a problem sadly found throughout the interstate system in five different instances. So let's start with the two I-76s. The first one goes from Ohio to New Jersey, and it runs 434 miles from Akron to Philadelphia. The second one runs from I-80 down to Denver, forming a sort of triangle around northern Colorado, and running just 175 miles. Next we have the two I-84s. One runs from Portland to Salt Lake City, going 769 miles through central Idaho and eastern Oregon. The second I-84 runs from Scranton, Pennsylvania over to central Massachusetts. It passes north of New York City, being a great way to avoid the city. It also passes through cities like Danbury and Waterbury in Connecticut, cities that are definitely made more relevant from the interstate. Next we have the two I-86s, one going from Binghamton to Erie, Pennsylvania. This one is 222 miles and has its own set of oddities unrelated to the repeat number. Most specifically, there's a portion that just stops being I-86 and turns into a normal state highway, then becoming I-86 yet again when it comes into the Binghamton area. The second I-86 is located in Idaho and runs just 63 miles between Pocatello and I-84, forming an interstate triangle in central Idaho. Now, I really can't tell you which one of these I'd rather get removed, because they both absolutely suck in general. 
But I'd say the eastern I-86 should stay, and the western should be converted to a spur route and be called I-184 or something like that. Then you have the 87s, the first of which runs from New York to the Canadian border, passing through important cities like Albany and Poughkeepsie. The second I-87 is probably the funniest interstate you'll ever find, running just 12 miles between Raleigh and a random interchange 12 miles from Raleigh. To put it simply, I have no idea why that interstate exists, or why it's designated as a north-south interstate even though it runs east to west. It's one of the most confusing two-digit interstates in the country. Finally, we have the two I-88s, one of which runs from Albany to Binghamton, passing through the mountains of central New York. The second one runs across northern Illinois from Chicago to the Quad Cities. Now, I'm really seeing a theme with all of these interstates, that being that most of them just kind of suck. It's been the same for basically every repeat interstate, but they just aren't very good and quite forgettable. So they think they can get away with making them twice. Like, imagine if there was two I-80s. You just wouldn't be able to get away with that because everyone knows I-80. But because these interstates are easily forgotten and just not, like, the most iconic uh, parts of the interstate system, they're able to just make two of them, and nobody really cares unless you're specifically looking. Finally, we're talking about I-238 in the Bay Area. This interstate runs just over two miles, connecting two other spur routes to each other. It's very short and simple, but what makes this spur route so interesting is that there isn't even an I-38, making 238 very confusing. This one isn't hard to explain. Basically, as I said before, it doesn't connect to any other two-digit interstates, making it hard to name. So instead of stretching it and naming it I-1080 or something like that, they named it I-238, after the state highway that goes in the area. So that means, even though it's still against the rules, at least it has a little bit of sense to it and has a good excuse for being the way it is. But anyways, that's going to be it for the second volume of Interstate Oddities. The interstate system is obviously not perfect, but it should be appreciated for what it is, which is one of the best national road systems in the world. Thanks for watching.